thank you. I mean, I will attest there are always new things to find in the bookstore. My current favorite book is The Glossy Rats that I just discovered in the corner over there. It's got a little squiggle showing the gloss on the rat. And I was wondering, I can't remember if I bothered to look up, so every once in a while, I will go into the old documentary photos we took when we were taking down the bookstore to remind myself whether you painted something or whether Red painted something. And I can't remember if, do you remember if you painted the glossy rats? I don't always remember what. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just, I have a list of questions here as a starting point, and I'm just going to ask you first, um, tell us a little bit about your artistic background because it's very interesting. Sure. Well, both my parents were artists, so I grew up completely immersed in it, um, all of their friends, and amongst their very very close friends was Red Grooms. So I've known Red since I was born, basically. Um, and uh, have, you know, intersected in various things he's done as a child, even. Um, the year before the bookstore was made, I played the big bad wolf in a the Red Riding Hood film that he made. I was 14 or so, something like that. So I did not actually participate in the original iteration of making the bookstore. But um, then when I was um, in high school, uh, I kind of, that's kind of when I marked the time that I first started working for Red, um, where I was, I, I seem to remember that I did, had done most of my credits and I, could basically kind of cut the second half of my day and go downtown and work for Red on a project he was doing. So that's, and you know, he was so generous to let me just kind of come in and basically hire me as a kid to, to do that. Um, so in terms of my experience around other artists, um, I think that um, I would kind of think of the matrix for me of my parents and Red as the really important triumvirate of artists that have influenced what I think being an artist is um, as, as models to me, you know? And uh, of course your parents are, are major models always of some sort. Um, but Red was, you know, my uncle almost in a way, so. Yeah. yeah. Do you mind saying who your parents are? Oh, sure. People sure. Don't know? So my father was Rudy Burkhart, who was um, a filmmaker, photographer, painter. Um, and my mother was Yvonne Jaquette, who had a retrospective here at the Hudson Review Museum 25 years ago, something like that. Yeah, um, but sometime like 2008. No, it must have been before no, that. No, it was not before, before this. It was when Michael Butman was yeah, here, though. Yeah, so yeah. It was in the 2000s, but yeah. early 2000s. So, um, you know, I'm married to an artist, Kathy Butterly. It's, yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you already answered so many of my questions, but they may provide jumping off points. And um, so I guess, you know, you had kind of answered when you first met Red Grooms, but I, I do have a, a couple follow-up questions. Like, um, one of my questions was going to be, did you me remember anything about the happenings, if you've ever heard of, like, Down in Soho back in the day, happenings, or the films? And then you already said that you were the big bad wolf in one of the films. but. I mean, I don't know, at what point did he move to Walker Street? Like, is that is such a mag magical place Red has been sure. in his Walker Street studio for since the 70s sure. or something, right? Yeah, I remember kind of when I was conscious enough to know where Red lived when Red and Mimi Gross were married and they were living on Mulberry Street. Um, and then in 1969, he got the studio on Walker Street. So I'm, I was born in 1964. So that was his studio from then on. And then he moved in there for a short time when him and Mimi split. Yeah. So I don't know, that was like maybe 1977 or so that he started living there for a little while. Uh, and he probably lived there for about almost 10 years until him and his second wife, Luciana, moved nearby. Well, that's kind of interesting then, because he must have been living in the studio when he was he working did. on this. He did, yes, absolutely. There's a picture of it around the corner there, kind of taken from a lofted area that was kind of like a bedroom. And you can look, I think it's shot from above, and you can kind of oversee a bit of the studio that's towards the back with everything happening. So he was really amidst all this, you know, chaos in a way. As well as many people often working for him, the crew would kind of come and go, like during Ruckus Manhattan, it might be 30 people at one time, at any given time. 
And then I think on the bookstore it was like maybe two or three probably. And then later times I was working for him, sometimes there'd be three or four of us, sometimes it was just me. Kind of came and go depending yeah. on the project. Yeah. And um, I, I, I've also been to the studio, which is a magical place, and he still has the sewing machine mm -hmm. that these figures were sewn on by Lori. Yeah. Uh, Sol? So, Sol Solon. Solon. Whose yeah. brother is Todd Solon, the very excellent filmmaker. Do you know those oh. films? Todd Solon's? Anybody know those? Yeah. I think he That's told me that before. And he, he actually worked, Todd worked for Red for a hot minute before getting hired for not knowing what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he found his, he found his now, metier somewhere else. Now this is a, a new side for me, because I was, knowing Red, I would imagine you had to do something pretty egregious yeah. to get fired by Red. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only really, in all my years, and it frankly is actually quite a bit more than 20 years that I've worked for Red. And depending on how you add it up, it's really closer to 27, 30, 30 years, something like that. And in that time, I've only seen a couple of people kind of had to be let go, rather gently, of course. Yeah. And um, yeah, one of them, I remember, he just fell asleep on the couch and slept through the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so to try to get a little bit of a particular memory, so you said you know you were in high school and you started like, didn't have any afternoon classes, or maybe you just left your afternoon classes and, and went and worked for Red. But like, whose idea was it? Were you like, Red, can I come do something for you? Or he was like, oh, your son seems kind of artistic. Like, well, certainly even before that moment of proper um, employment, I was around and did things with Red just kind of very informally. And during Ruckus Manhattan, when I was, what, like maybe 10 or 11, I remember going down when they were working on Pine Street where they had this space set up to make the whole thing and spending a day painting little things that went in the Wall Street, you know, um, trading floor or whatever. So. I was all, and he kind of, you know, um, I was an artistic kid, and so, you know, he, you know, I probably gave him presents as a kid or whatever, and he would paint me or, you know, all of our family and stuff like that. So it wasn't a kind of, I don't remember the answer actually, like who proposed this? Was it him or me? Um, it was a, it, I remember what it was was that he was doing a project called the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Cornucopia. So I wasn't, I was one of already probably six or seven or eight people that were working there, so I just kind of added in. Um, yeah. So I, but I don't remember whose idea. It's kind of odd that you didn't end up working on the bookstore. Did do you remember yeah. ever coming to see it? There was a big opening celebration. Yes, when it I do remember that. I do remember coming and seeing it. But this is this would have been like a few. This would have been um, when I was a freshman. Or so in high school. Yeah. So yeah. so I wasn't quite ready. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. So again, you've already answered a lot of my questions, but because I was going to say during the twenty years you worked with Red, what were some of the projects you contributed to? You've already mentioned a bunch of them, or at least some got, of the ones you I got worked some on. More too, yeah. yeah, you mentioned yeah. some more. I mean, and I think I believe. When was it that he put up parts of Ruckus Manhattan in Grand Central? Because I think I saw that when yeah. I was first here. I think that was in about 1994 or 5. <laughs> and I did work on that, where a bunch of pieces got brought out and kind of reconfigured with some other pieces, such as the alleyway, which part of showed here at one point. Um, and I don't remember who's, who, who sponsored that happening exactly. but. Um, so there's new projects I've worked on him, which could be anything from like a small studio piece of some sort, where I'm helping him, uh, you know, sculpt something in let's say foam from based from a sketch of his, and then he gives me the sketch, and I will kind of work up the sculptural part of it, and maybe we coat it with epoxy or something, and then he takes it back to paint it or something like that. That might be typical, typical, which would typically happen with a small studio project. But then these larger pieces of um, which I can kind of figure out how many have been. Um, there was there was one we did called the bus, which was around 1994 also, and that, that was the one that sold to Freeze a few years ago, right? Which, is, a, which is still about to be set up in Rotterdam, and I'm waiting for the coordination because I'm kind of the 
person who's standing who knows how to do it. So I get to, I get to, so that's. It's a full size bus. It's a full yes. size bus, yeah. So this is the other thing is that I get called on for projects not just like this, but like if something of his that is complicated, that I have some intimate knowledge either of having made it or setting it up several times before, such as many of the pieces from Marcus Manhattan, I get called on to go travel someplace, let's say, and be the point person to set it up. Yeah. Maybe maybe me and another assistant of some era from Red. Mm -hmm. So I've been to Japan yeah. a few times yeah. for doing that with Red. I've been you know with many root museums around the country here as well doing doing things like that. Well, well, this is something you've kind of touched on, but I think it would be interesting to people to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, you know, a lot of times people think of an artist as, oh, the artist like made the whole thing themselves, but clearly that's not always true. You know, we have, you know, the woodwork in our mansion was made by Daniel Pass, but clearly he worked on it with many, many assistants. And so Red's work is so collaborative over the years. I mean, there's no way that Red Grooms, you know, even in his prime could paint this many things all by himself. So he's always working with a lot of assistants and I've seen that done in other projects that were here at the museum. But if you want to talk a little bit about his sure. collaborative process? Yeah. Um, I think there's something about the tone of the work that where people probably don't get their back up about the idea he didn't do everything. I think there's some kinds of work where you have more of an expectation of it being like the great author idea of it being done solely by an artist. And there's something about the energy in his work, the openness, the giving, the givingness of it, that I think probably people understand that, even intuitively, that, that it involved other people to, to, to make it done, happen. And I think that it really goes back to one of his super early influences, which is movies. And the, the paradigm in that is that you have someone whose vision it is, who's the director. Maybe they wrote the film as well, even. But there's this whole kind of people who have some specialization of certain things to make the whole thing come together because one person just cannot do it. So I think that he's like a director in that in that kind no of sense. Sure. Yeah. And um, to speak from my experience being someone in his studio, the reason I stayed there that long is because it is incredibly satisfying to do on, on a few counts. One is that Red is just the most wonderful person and is very generous and lovely and incredibly smart and knowledgeable, although not in the in kind of like, you know, art grad school kind of way, you know, it's not that kind of thing, but he knows, he knows a tremendous amount. He's very curious and always has been. So working with him is a total pleasure in terms of what the chatter is in the studio, for one thing. So that's wonderful. But the other thing is that he has this generosity of including you, I'm going to say you, but I mean me as one of the collaborators in the work. And um, he, he is the, you know, the ultimate author of the whole thing, for sure. And his name goes on it. But the participation of someone like me is very satisfying from a creative perspective because um, the work is always changing what you're going to do. You're never just making the same kind of thing. You're never just like, you know, cleaning up, sanding down a bronze or something like that. It's sometimes you're working in this material, sometimes you're working in another material. The, the way the process works is always kind of interesting and imaginative. Um, and the other thing is he was very, very generous about giving credit to all of us. So we would get our names on things a, a lot of the time. You know, either if he had a, a show at a gallery, make sure that our names were up on the wall, like, you know, Red Grooms, he thanks us, he says things, whatever. Uh, and even if that wasn't the case, it would, you know, I would feel that way personally from him. Anyway, so it's, uh, it was incredibly fun and satisfying um, to bring, you know, it's not a, it's not an equality of collaboration. He's the, he's the, the leader of the whole thing, but, you, but I got to kind of bring things to the work, suggestions or ideas that he was very rarely would squash. He was always kind of open, like, oh, I like that, you know. So it was very, um, you know, satisfying on my part to be able to kind of contribute whatever little smaller idea to the larger idea that's his. The, the structure is his, the uh, superstructure, the whole thing. And you, you answered a little bit of what I was going to ask you to talk about also. It's just for everybody's benefit, a little bit about Red, because mm -hmm. I have enjoyed so much yeah. working with Red. He is just this sort of dryly funny, generous, 
humorous kind of person that you might imagine yeah. to create something like this, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, really the first word I always think about when I talk about him is generous. So that, going back to what I said is in terms of my sense of modeling myself on both my parents, but then read almost equally, is this idea of being an artist as a generous person. And also being an artist that is just really involved with enjoying themselves making work. And so in some ways, working for Red was the counterweight to me not going to graduate school for art because I felt like I was getting what I, for me, that suited me, my personality, my creative ideas better was this kind of sense of incredible momentum and motivation that is in his personality, in his work, and that I got to participate in and kind of learn how to do from him in a lot of ways. And I always thought of him as something, someone that would open the gates to what you wanted to do. And I had a bit of a vision or a fear of grad school being one that would narrow the gates. You know, sometimes it's really good to kind of bring focus to something, but I was like, I wanna, I wanna have, I don't wanna, I don't wanna have anything, nothing be a no. Always a yes, kind of, yeah. and see what happens. But you know, that's the kind of the more operating principles to work from yes yeah. and no. Well, Red's definitely about maximalism. I mean, I think yeah. you can see that at the bookstore, yeah. and he has often said, you know, that's one reason he was attracted to the Pierpont Morgan Library because he loves that Victorian horror vacuity of just stuff yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, because uh, we're interviewing you, what do you think it did you bring? Like, what do you bring? when you're coming to a RED project. Because I know from watching you install this, and just mm -hmm. so people understand, all, all of these panels you know, came from the original bookstore, but then every once in a while, the way you fit them together, there was a little white gap that had to be filled in. Yeah. And one of my favorite stories was finding you wandering around in the mansion in mm -hmm. Glenview, and I said, well, you know, what are you doing, Tom? And should I need something dark to paint in this area? <laughs> And so I showed you Aida, right. and you painted her there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that, especially with this occasion of having all the drawings here, it really does illuminate um, a typical process for him, not the only one. And, and it, it, this is the way for me to describe about what my role is. What I was doing when you found me there was kind of in the mode of working where, where these drawings are from, which is that he's going and he's, his secret weapon is that he's a tremendous observational artist, that he can go out and kind of, he's a draftsman and a, a drawer, and that's how he kind of gets his, um, his imagery is from out there in the world. Um, so he, all these drawings are from on, you know, on site in, in either the Morgan or the Mendoza bookstore. And then the conceit that is original is that he then kind of shuffles the deck together in a sense, and things get kind of mixed up and the kind of uh, reportage kind of context of, you know, this is truth gets kind of remixed with these other things so that it becomes a, a, a hybrid space, let's say, between two different things, two different tonalities of, of a bookstore or a repository of books. And the kind of the bumping up of those things is what then um, kind of comes out of it and that's kind of the energy created. So. Um, when it got moved over here from where it was the actual gift shop, my role was to, um, well we had to take, there were actual functional things in the original bookstore that were like the cash register where things were bought and this tables and, and racks were things that hold, held actual books and merchandise and stuff like that. So when that got kind of taken out of the thing and it got brought here as more of a standalone artwork, there was a bit of a hole in the center of the whole thing in a way. So what, um, so my, my process was meeting with Red, and I, maybe we looked through the sketches a little bit, the books, but um, I had gotten a lot of, you know, um, I'd come and visited the thing before it got deinstalled, and took a lot of photographs, and kind of met with him over several times, and we talked about this idea that we had to kind of put something more in the middle, so we talked about some of the things in the, in the bookstore that could be move more from the periphery to the center, which is that kind of whole island of books such as 
Mr. Mendoza, no, no it's, not, yeah. name, it's not named Mr. Mendoza, yeah, the guy who was the original. Karen, is it something? Yeah. Walter, Walter Karen. Karen is like and there's a model over there, you can yeah. see the table outside, and it actually was yes. outside of the That's original. right. Yeah. So that table was, seemed to me one of the, be the things that would work really well to move into the center, but it was still going to be not quite enough. So what I met with Greg was uh, on was like, let's come up with a bunch of like interesting book titles. So we met and kind of drew up things. Some of them were my ideas, like I think Waterfalls of Chad as a book was my <laughs> idea, you know, things like that. Um, so, and then some were his, um, and it kind of met, was meant to match the way that the titles were done on the original one. Um, and Red is an absolutely <coughs> amazing writer in an absurdist kind of vein. He's, he's rather dyslexic and the worst speller I've ever met. So you wouldn't <laughs> think that he's kind of a natural writer, but he's, he's super imaginative and uh, has an air of ridiculousness to him, his approach to, to writing in a way. So, so we kind of talked about some of these new books we would work in and move the, the guy selling the books more to the center reshuffle some of the things. Um, so, you know, that was kind of done with him, and he, you know, he. I feel very grateful that he trusts me to do these things, you know, so it took several months to kind of recreate some of those things in my studio, and then maybe three, four weeks or something in here to reset it up. I don't know, it, yeah. took, it took a while. Yeah, while well, you were here, I think at least for a solid month. Yeah. I exactly. have the pictures to prove yeah. it. Um, I mean, one of my favorite drawings, even though it's very sketchy that we have open over there in the case, is that he was taking notes on the actual book titles yeah. of, the, of the table, which stood outside of the actual Mendoza's. So, you know, we included a few photographs in the show and so that you can see how much he was really mm -hmm. riffing on, sure. you know, what he actually yeah. saw. I, I mean, I think that when, when I was talking to him about the new book title, well, new, 2008, um, I think I came up with more fictionalized book titles than he would have had originally. But it was yeah. it was all, and it was it was things that I had done in some of my work, such as Full Stop, which we showed here, which was before this reconstruction, of making some sort of commentary in these fictionalized book titles in a way. And yeah. so, in some ways, that's some that's something as a practice of the liberty to do that that I received from him as my teacher, so to speak, right. that I folded back to him in the process of this thing. Well, I believe in one of the original newspaper articles, he claimed that all the book titles were true. I but that probably also, they probably were, I think so. Some of them maybe were, but I mean, that is his dry yeah. sense of humor. So, um, let's see, I think some of these we have covered. Um, and I mentioned people should, after the thing, go over and look at the model, because that is the model that was presented to the museum when the bookstore was first here. And if you look inside and you see all the white spaces, that is where, you know, all the museum's, um, you know, merchandise was. And that's how it was when I first started um, working here. Um, and then, okay, I guess, I, you already talked about making the new elements a little bit. I mean, I remember when Red came to visit you know, when we were getting close to the end, remember that day, yeah. and and he was here, and um, you know, I tried to film a little bit of it, but we didn't have these fancy mics here mm -hmm. and stuff. But and I asked him, you know, what are you looking for? And and he said, it has to feel, it has to feel like the bookstore to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to feel right. He said, I'll know it the minute I walk in. <laughs> right. You yeah. know, and um, and that was partly when we had the conversation about what was going to be on the table. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Because I, we maybe had brought up the old cash register, we mm -hmm. talked about it, and that's when he talked to you. So it was very collaborative. I Absolutely. remember that's right then when he said, maybe you should make a cash box, or maybe you suggested the cash yeah. box. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing was that when I came up here today, I haven't been here in a few years, and I really needed to walk through there to kind of just jog all my memory in a way. And the first thing that I felt I had a challenge was was actually figuring out what I had remade and what was original. And I was like, I was pleased with the fact that it was taking me a little while to figure out what was what. <laughs> that, that meant it integrated well and it fit and, and 
if I couldn't quite tell initially, I hope no one else can at all. Yeah. I think that open door over in the corner over there is something that you, for some reason, had to make. Yeah. Um, well, recently, I mean, when I say that I find new things in the bookstore all the time, I am not kidding. Um, and I think, um, you know, so recently we had found, I had noticed on, this, on the one of the books, in the very corner over there near the ground is a portrait of Red. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I thought Red told us there wasn't a portrait mm -hmm. in here. But it's actually, I think it's called, and the book title is Red on Red. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I did, I was wondering if you put it there as an homage, but then I looked through all the pictures mm -hmm. when we deinstalled the bookstore, we had taken very good documentation yeah. of everything, and there it was. No, so Red so had to put that there, and, but maybe it was hiding in some corner, you know, in the mm -hmm. original bookstore where you didn't see it as much. But um, another thing that I like about uh, the fact that people can really go in and appreciate the bookstore for its own sake now, and not be shopping is, you know, one time I walked by and I heard some family in there and the parents said to the kid, yes, it is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that kids, you know, maybe were a little more distracted, even though it's so amazing, when they were looking for their like, you know, magic space ice cream or like whatever they were gonna buy, you know, in the bookstore. But when they go in there now, it's just all about that. And I'd love to have kids in there. I'm like, do you see the carpenter ants? You know, do you see the ghost rats? I mean, you will see new stuff every time. So um, let's see, what else we're gonna talk about that. Oh, what was the biggest challenge for you of this project? In this project? I think that I was a little hung up on and maybe read even about the original function and what was going to happen when that was taken out of it because it was really intended as this kind of hybrid thing to be part functional bookstore and so it really had that intent at its center all the time when it was made. So I think it was really a question whether it would feel like it was, you know, a little hollow in the center without that function, because that was always in everyone's back of mind when it was originally made, is how to kind of have it fit around the function. So when that got kind of changed, um, I, 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 it, I think I would say this, if it was a piece that wasn't designed for that original thing, I think there would have been some things that Red would have done differently about setting up some particular focus in it somehow such as there's a piece he made about the New York Public Library that at its center has this crazy table that has all these characters from Moby Dick on it. So he kind of drilled into something so there's a kind of a, uh, you know, a, a cast of characters at the center of it. And in this original thing, the, the, in a sense the commerce of it was the character in a way. And some of the figures were on the periphery in a way. So it was, I think that was the biggest question we had is could we make that central and have it feel right? Yeah, I mean, you bring, you bring up a couple of, couple of thoughts. Uh, one is that in the bookstore, as you say, things were happening in the original bookstore, but also here, and when Sarah Linda and I were working on the interpretation when it was first reinstalled, one of the things we, we thought a lot about the happenings and sort of the carnival sets he went to the spiral by. And we thought about the fact that the live people that go in it are also part of it. Right. You know, you especially so yeah, when there's a theatrical, like, you know, uh, in college, and, you know, was that you're, you're, you become a character too. Right. You know, and so, and that's true in this iteration as well as in the original one. The person that worked for the museum that stood behind the cash register in the original one was one of the characters. But you're also yes, a character right. when you walk in right but, now. But it is a little bit of a trans, transposition of what the play was. If yeah. you use the stage yeah. set metaphor, is that originally, yeah, you walk in and you'd be like, wow, holy smoke, you know, but, but you would also kind of be there to buy something in a way. And so when it gets moved here, people's behavior is often different because of their expectations of museum behavior. And, you know, this is one of the great pieces that tries its best to break that, you know, silent shuffle or whatever through the museum or whatever. So, but it's still kind of, um, it's still a, a, a slightly different proposition for those people going into it. It is the favorite selfie spot, I would yeah, say. For sure. And both Masha and I have had headshots done in here too, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because it is the perfect frame. Um, but I think, now correct me if I'm wrong, 
wasn't this the first one Red did that where he was having to fit it into a place where it would stay? Because there are actually, yeah. I was fascinated I to find true. in the sketchbooks that there was one that was just showing the coffers in the ceiling and where the lights were, mm -hmm. or like where the where the water fountain was, because he was having to yes. fit it into an architectural space where it was going to stay. Where like Ruckus Manhattan is a lot of pieces that you can just move around like on a chessboard. That's true. Where you want them. That's true. I would say that there are some of his pieces where there is a initial space where it's supposed to be brought into, and there is a kind of a design constriction in terms of that, but not necessarily in a permanent way. So um, this one was the first one like that, and I think, you, Sarah you mentioned two of them. I believe the only other one would be Tut's Fever at the Museum of Moving Image in Astoria. Uh, this and that are the only two permanent Rooms pieces yeah. that are set maybe up. Maybe the bus once it gets put together. That's, maybe that's what she's thinking. Well, of. no, I don't even think that's quite the same thing in a way. Both this and that are really architecturally embedded, and although yeah. the bus mm -hmm. perhaps might be up kind of long term foreverish, yeah. it's still more of a standalone piece. Okay, then I guess I have a two part question. What was your favorite part of the project, and what is your favorite detail in the? Bookstore, although that that could be a hard one. I mean, I have some, um, maybe one. Mm -hmm. I, if someone asked me, but what's what's yours? I, I it, going back, it was making up the book titles. You know, <laughs> um, I really enjoyed that, and um, I feel I feel a little bit of ownership on that on that part, and the kind of. Um, there's, there's kind of supposed to be in these kind of secondhand books. There's, there's always these pile of the dollar books that are the books that maybe no one ever will read again or ever read. Or ever read. <laughs> so there's a sense of their obsolescence in a way, and they're kind of like they're still there, even though they're talking about like you know what is the economic outlook of 1973. Must <laughs> I read that now? Say, right? You know. Um, so there's all the so you know just the way the the book design, the way that ages and dates itself, the kind of the titles and things like that. So, um, or just the fact that somewhere someone will make a book called The Waterfalls of Chad, potentially. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So. so is that your favorite? Yeah, I think that's oh, my sorry, favorite. The Waterfalls of Chad. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there was another one, Albanian style, that um, I <laughs> snuck a friend's name. I have an Albanian friend, so I snuck his name into the, as the author. <laughs> 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 Kind of, you know, little little quirks of kind of poetic things like that. Yeah. I mean, my, my my favorite detail probably just because I also was studying Renaissance art and at one point thought I might go into Renaissance art are the patrons in the ceiling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you go in there, look up. There is the director of the museum and the curator and the head art handler and a few other people that I haven't figured out who they all are. Yeah, yeah. And I almost wish that you had, or maybe you did and I haven't found it, painted yourself in there. Oh, no, no. You should have. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see. Um, we, we're, we have a little bit more time left. Tell us a little bit about your own installation work because I mean, did anybody here come to Full Stop and see that installation? <laughs> My <aunt>. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. And, but also at the time, I remember you were talking about that upside down flooded room or whatever yeah. it was that became that installation you did in India. Yep. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about that, and well, then, yeah, then I want you to talk about your painting. Sure, too. sure. So, well, the first one, I've really only done two proper ones of those, and the first one was Full Stop, and that was had a, a lot to do with Red. It was, in a sense, my retirement piece in my mind from working for Red really full time. Although, after that, I you know would go back and help him on projects anyway, so wasn't fully retired. But um, that piece was, in a sense, everything I kind of learned from him in a lot of ways. Uh, done different than he would do, though. First thing was that it had no color. Uh, it was just cardboard color, brown, and black paint. And so that that seemed to me something that Red would have never done. But the kind of, the, the, the things that I'm talking about there in these drawings, like basing it on kind of repertorial fact and observational, um, you know, drawing, and gathering images in a way, and then you shuffle them together in a way that is not so specific, like time specific or place specific in context. 
So everything gets a little turned turned around. So that the first piece, Full Stop, was a piece that was kind of about a classic era New York school artist studio that maybe was 1955 or something. But then there were other things in it which were like, let's say, books. Again, my favorite thing to make up these book titles that were way more contemporary. So it was very, it was confused, and it was supposed to dislocate you in terms of like what, you know, it not being a specific thing. A lot of people thought it was literally an image of my studio, and th that was not it. It was more in a kind of a prototypical studio where the topic of it was like, what if you have everything you need, you have all your tools, all your materials, all your postcards and books, and all of that kind of history to support you. Um, and a beautiful space, and you don't know what to make anymore as an artist. So that was kind of the um, subterranean narrative in the whole thing that for me was about something that was very um, scary and uh, even like almost pathetic or whatever. So I wanted to have this kind of undercurrent of the possibility of the negativity of being found in that place of artist block or something like that. Yeah, full stop. Yeah, the full stop. Yeah. But but that you would but that as a viewer you'd walk into it and like pieces like this, you would be kind of have an amazement factor of like, wow, look at the um, attention to detail, look at the just you know at work the ethic. Paint can the, or brushes. Right. The yeah. work ethic to kind of realize this and make all this stuff, you know, that is counter to the kind of, you know, cooler New York minimalist kind of aesthetics, let's say. So it was to kind of, you know, to kind of mess with that a little bit. And then yeah. the other piece that you mentioned was uh, done in India, and that was done for a biennial in India where in this part of India they have a lot of, they're continuing to have a lot of environmental problems from flooding. Most of the population lives at sea level, and they're having terrible floods because of climate change. and. We had experienced Hurricane Surge Superstorm Sandy in New York, and so I felt that that was a bridging topic that I could do there that would be readable and make sense to an Indian audience. And so, likewise, that was a kind of a, a somewhat tragic type of narrative behind the thing. Yeah, but, wasn't, the, wasn't the flood hanging yeah, on the ceiling or something? Yeah, I so my, my, it. in the wonder of this piece and my first piece was that get to walk into it and be the animating factor as a, and you know, as a living person in the static space, the, the static piece. So for this one where I wanted to depict the flood, I was like, how do I get people into the space? If, if they walk on the water, then it has some sort of Jesus metaphor. I don't want that. <laughs> um, how do I get them to go into the space, to penetrate the space if the image is a flood? And then one night I was like about to drop, drop, drop off to sleep and I said, just turn it upside down. And I was like, and that's a great metaphor. So it was a, a, a room that was turned upside down so that the top surface just over your head was the water surface. And it wasn't like you were under the water because everything else in the room was turned upside down. All the stuff was leaning up or all the paintings were floating in the, you know, the surface of the water per se. So it was the metaphor of your, you know, everything turned upside down like that does to you, you know, a situation like that. And I've seen a lot of your, your other work, which is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, where can they see your work right now? And what, what will they see? What is it about? Um, I don't think I have anything up on view right now. Um, but the, just this past summer, I had a show at the Bowdoin Museum of 385 little book page collages that I've done that were hung all around a room, probably about this size, on three walls. Um, and they were. Um, again, back to my kind of book fascination, they were all taken from like the title page of a book, so you'd get the kind of a title or maybe a chapter heading, so there'd be one little bit of text, found text, and then there would be this um, kind of color abstraction situation that would happen with it, which wasn't an illustration, it wasn't graphic design of the text, it was a kind of a, a, a something that bumped up against it and didn't necessarily always illustrate it, let's say. Um, and then paintings, I make large paintings a lot, small paintings. Uh, I, uh, I mean, this is really, bringing it back to red, is that it was the model of like, just do whatever excites you. That's, the, that's your job, is to be as excited and passionate about it, and then if you do that part, potentially you get an audience for it. 
if you think about the audience too much, you either underestimate them or you don't even know what they want. It, it's a kind of a recipe for failure, to my, in my opinion. So it, it's really just the model, like make yourself as excited about what you're doing as possible and they'll come kind of thing. Wow, well, I mean, it's all been really great. I was gonna close with a question that I think you pretty much answered, but if you wanted to say a final word, I was gonna say in a personal sense, what does Red Rooms represent to you? Really that first word again is generous. And so he was generous to me as a you know collaborator, as an employee. I mean, you know, the Christmas gifts I'd get for him. I have a Basquiat print that he gave me, an original Basquiat print that he gave me one year for Christmas, let's say. He would often give me like back in the day a gift certificate for three hundred dollars for pearl paint when that was still around <laughs> for supplies. Um, so you know, he was generous on that level. Um, he was uh, just generous in terms of, you know, exchange of ideas, what we would talk about. Um, but I think that it's, there's, there's a lot of pitfalls in trying to be having your career as an artist and becoming kind of bitter or, um, or you know, it's, that you think it's some sort of zero sum game where if, if you're, if someone else is succeeding, they're taking something away from you potentially. And I think he really showed me that that's a false idea. And so, you know, just, he, he always reached out to me, he always reached out to other artists and was friendly and would talk to them or whatever. And so I've always felt that that's what I wanted to do as an artist if I could. Well, he's also been always more than generous to the museum. Yeah. I mean, he and Lizzie Ann donating these drawings, but just in his time and in his love of this bookstore and in his sharing of all his experience with it over the years. Um, I think we have time for a few questions, if anybody has any questions for Tom. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about the creation of that character behind you there? Yes, I don't know who that is, let me see. <laughs> He's in one of the sketchbooks. It's actually, this is this was in the original bookstore. I'm sorry to yeah, answer yeah. the question for Tom in case he doesn't mm -hmm. remember. There was a little storage area, right? And this was the doors to the storage area. This was something we couldn't quite repurpose for the thing, I think, in there. Mm -hmm. Is what I. Was, what but I, 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 I'm assuming that Red saw this guy somewhere, and I, because I recognize some of the elements from slides we have of the Mendoza bookstore, yeah. I'm sure it's there. And the guy's got a book. This is how to test your own IQ. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this is definitely from the hat that's the Mendoza bookstore. And the other thing is that this quote, which is, which I don't oh, know what yeah, it's from, but we did, we did it, we did it, we re, we re brought that, is that the same one? Yeah, it is, it one? is. We can, so you um, put that no, no, oh, yeah. in there. So we, re, we did bring that back into the other space and, and we did it and we, and I didn't remember what it was from. It was from here originally, as far as I was concerned, but we re, re Reverse Googled it and found out it's yeah, from Jabberwocky. Yeah, Masha will be happy to hear that because I didn't find it. It's, it's from Jabberwocky. Did Brad do that whole thing himself or was well, it collaborative? Well, it was mostly that. Yeah. But it yeah. sometimes, yeah, something special he'll take on so himself. So after all my years, I can kind of see his hand and I can even after many years, even when I was like, you know, 20 years old, recognize something of my hand. And for sure that's him. That's his work. And you know, maybe that's someone different. I'm not sure about that, but it mostly looks like something he would paint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A book title: Divorce Yourself. <laughs> yeah. that, I think that's that's one of those things that like that I was working in the spirit of like you know did he actually see that book? Maybe, maybe not. Well, but you said that was right after he got divorced and was living by himself <laughs> in, the, in the studio. But but yeah, I think and then we just like literally Tom and I were standing here right before this started and I was saying we were trying to find that boat and we couldn't find it anywhere and Tom said, Did you ask AI? And I said, Oh no. So he checked one AI and I checked what what uh, my partner calls Hal nine thousand, which is Bing's co pilot. And it did say it had something to do with Jabberwocky, but then I read the poem, and it's not literally in the poem. Maybe it's the framework in Alice's Looking Glass, like around the way the poem is brought up. Cool. Now I, I have to go back and find it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I just want to um, share my experience with Oh, hey, oh, yeah. well, this is, this is <laughs> Ken Davis who took all the photographs. Oh, great. Right. Uh, I, I was with the college when I was in business, become an art teacher, uh -huh. which I never became, uh, which I never 
at the actual art class, yeah. the little class. But I did my intern here at the Hutchman Museum when Red Rooms was um, building the bookstore. Back in 78, 79? Um, yes. I, yeah. No, I, I would say, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, about 78, 79, yeah. Yeah. right? And I remember him because they sent me down, yeah, I was in his loft, I photographed him down in his loft. Mm -hmm. So when I came back up there and I, when I look at these pictures now, well not pictures, the, the sculpture, like you have Al, the, the security guard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember Al being the security guard when I worked at the bookstore. And I was also photographed there. And my name is Hector. Is, is, is that your photograph out in the hallway of Red? It, it, it might yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. No, that but, would um, be something else. But, but. I mean, it's funny. And I, and I became a police officer later on. Mm -hmm. So I've gone back to photography. But every time, I remember I was at City Hall. And I was at, in the engineering room. And I recognize Red Moon for any So it was really, it really impressive in my life. Yeah, you know, every black and white photograph that we have from that period was taken yeah. by okay. Ken. And I was so excited when I finally met you. Yeah. You were here for a Juneteenth event, or maybe I met you before that yeah. in the 90s. And I was like, wait a minute, are you that Ken Davis? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he's I still, am that still, Ken Davis. He still remember me when he did the one I think with the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he yeah. still, still remember me. So there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. What's the relationship between the two parts? Yeah, so that half, which kind of is splitting where the end of the gray stones is, that's the Morgan Library half, and this is the Mendoza uh, Bookstore half. So the Mendoza Bookstore was a very, it's gone now, but it was a, when a like, you know, 100 year old bookstore downtown that was just, you know, a jumble, kind of like the Strand, let's say, if anyone Did you go there, actually? Uh, I don't remember ever going there myself, no. And then the Morgan, of course, is like the toniest place that books can end up in New York City, anyway. So that kind of mixing of the two, there's kind of, in a sense, a dividing of the thing on the outside, but in this inside, it kind of gets swirled together in a certain way. Yeah, and Red really likes that idea of high and low art and not really making a distinction between them. You know, even though the term wasn't invented yet, he would be the original mashup mm -hmm. artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is one of the characters inside based on your father? I don't think so. No? Okay. I have to go. I don't think so. <laughs> Rudy, my dad, Rudy, has been and has been included in some of Red's pieces for sure, but I don't think it's in this one. But, but he was part of the happenings and stuff like that, right? My, okay. my dad wasn't quite. No, the hap you know, the proper period of the happenings was um, him and Red might have known each other tiny, but but that's like late 50s. I feel like him and Red really got close around 1960 onwards. Right. And um, there, there are some other theater things that Red did, like in 1972, he did this thing called um, uh, um, Hippodrome Hardware, which I had a role in throwing tomatoes at, at, at Red at one point. Because it, in, in performance, you know, I had to go every night with rotten tomatoes and throw them at him <laughs> and the thing. Um, but that's really not even quite proper happenings chronology, let's say. Yeah. Right, okay. Happenings revival. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The original notion behind moving it was it in terms of conservation or new functionality for the? Um, I mean, there were a few reasons. I mean, conservation was certainly part of it. Also, when the bookstore was first installed, we did not have our lobby there. When you came into the museum, if anybody remembers, there was more like a, a breezeway, and then you entered the museum and you walked past the Pierpont Morgan section and around the corner where that black area is on the model is where the museum's front desk was. So uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to create an actual lobby to greet people and not, you know, just have it all happening in the galleries. And so, you know, it did need to be deinstalled to protect it while all that was going on. So that was the genesis of the notion. And then to, you know, some of it you actually had to restore, right? Yeah. I know. It, it got um, beat up, for sure. Yeah, there were areas that had been worn and, you know, and so that was also a big part of it. And also imagine what a museum bookstore meant in 1978 to, to kind of like 25 years later in terms of the importance of it just in terms of bringing people in, audience, commercial thing, questions, you know. You know, it used to be just only books in there, bookstores and art. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And now it's often more other stuff than books, even. You know, I think, you know, I mean, 
when I started here, the bookstore was only about six years old, and it was already such a key feature of the museum. Everyone was so proud of it. Everyone was so happy to have it here. But then I think over the years, you know, as our role as its caretaker settled in, and also as the importance and stature of recognizing what an icon of American art read is, uh, th then it, it, our role to care for it, like it shifted and became more clear that this was something that really needed to be protected. And, and you know, yeah. yeah. And so it was appropriate to shift it. Yeah, just a couple of points that I just have to, I have to make some connections. When you talked about Red's love of mixing high and low art, and I don't know if this is an urban legend or not, but it's very possible that his that the agents of, of Morgan would come down to a place like Mendoza's bookstore and find you know treasures like a Gutenberg Bible, which we have in there, to bring back uptown. You know, which is is just so wonderful because Red is just making fun of the distinctions <coughs> between yeah. uptown and downtown, which obviously has come to pass. Right. You know, in New York certainly. And the other thing I, I wanted to mention, you know, just thinking about the conversation about the theatrical elements and happenings and how it is the the visitor that really activates the space in the sense of a happening. I think. Red was so prescient, taking the concept of a happening and building a space like this, which was kind of like predates immersive theater. Experience, experience the based, like art yeah. things like Van Gogh Alive or whatever those kind of things. Well, I think more of Sleep No More. Yeah. That's yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. But, and that, and now there's a new Faust one. So he, it's really, he's bringing together, just as we like to do in the museum, the different disciplines. So mm -hmm. there is really no distinction between visual art, theatrical art, and, and poetry, and you know, and your book titles. So um, I think that you know, it's just yeah. once you get started, there's just yeah, so much yeah. there. I think everyone's dying to get in there and look I know, around. I you know. It's, it's <laughs> two minutes till three, so this seems like a good point to close. And I want to thank everyone for coming. It's been such a special afternoon, and um, you know, of course, we could talk about. The store for hours, but it's better if you walk around in there and find find your favorite detail, find something that you have never noticed before. Look for the carpenter ants and the queen bee and the, and the glossy rats. So. <laughs>